We have two scripture readings today, and the first is from Acts chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And then we turn to John chapter 14, the first six verses. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to, the, you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The greatest event so far in the history of the world was, is the coming of Jesus Christ into this world. God came near, or as C.S. Lewis put it, God has landed on this enemy-occupied world in human form. And each year at Christmas we are reminded of this amazing miracle, that God came as one of us into this world. And yet there's another very important event in the future, the greatest of all future events which we are waiting for, and that's the second coming of Jesus. There's a magazine by the net brother called Today in the Word, and in their April 1989 edition, there was an article written on the second coming of Jesus. And it said, Biblical prophecy provides some of the greatest encouragement and hope available to us today. Just as the Old Testament is saturated with prophecies concerning Jesus' first advent, so both Testaments are filled with references to the second coming of Christ. One scholar has estimated that there are 1,845 references to Christ's second coming in the Old Testament, where 17 books give it prominence. In the 260 chapters of the New Testament, there are 318 references to the second advent of Jesus, an amazing one out of every 30 verses. 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer to this great event. For every prophecy, this is the important part, for every prophecy in the Bible concerning Christ's first advent, there are eight which look forward to his second. Jesus came to this earth in human form. He was put to death on a Roman cross. He died, he was buried, and he rose again from the dead. He remained on the earth for another 40 days, and then he ascended back into heaven, where he now reigns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But one day he will return. He will be back, and we can be certain of this. During his lifetime, he fulfilled more than 300 ancient prophecies about himself. On the day that he died, he fulfilled 29 of them. God has always kept his promises, and one of them which is yet to be fulfilled is the second coming of Christ. It hasn't happened yet, but we can know this with absolute certainty. He will return. Martin Lloyd-Jones was one of the great preachers of the 20th century. And he said the great doctrine of the second advent has in a sense fallen into disrepute because of this tendency on the part of some to be more interested in the how and the when of the second coming rather than the fact of the second coming. If we believe the words of the Bible, we cannot doubt the certainty of his return. Jesus himself said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. 
I will come again and will take you to myself, that, you, that where I am you may be also. And his words could not be any plainer. The two angels that appeared to the, the apostles at the ascension said, This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The apostle Paul often wrote about the second coming of Christ. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 from verse 7, he wrote, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, in, in, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you is believed. 2 Peter 3 verse 10, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. The book of Revelation begins with this promise, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, Amen. Now, there are many more, but the message is clear. Jesus Christ will return. And we are living on this timeline somewhere between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming. He came once 2,000 years ago, and he is coming again someday. But the purpose and the means of his second coming is going to be radically different from his first. The second time he comes, he will not come to warn, to teach, or to invite. He did that the first time. When he was here the first time, he said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's not going to say that the second time. He's not going to come back to set us an example of godly living. He did that the first time. Jesus has already given us the perfect example and we don't need another example. When he comes again, he's not coming to die for our sins. Never again will he, have, will he have to agonize in prayer over the looming cross in the Garden of Gethsemane. Never again will he be beaten with a whip. Never again will he carry his own cross to Golgotha. Never again will they drive nails into his hands and his feet and lift up the cross and leave him there to die. Jesus died once for all sins, past, present, and future, and he will not die a second time. So the question then is, why is he coming again? He is coming for his church. He's coming for his bride, for his people. He's coming to raise the dead. He said in John 5, 20, 28 and 29, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. When he comes the second time, according to Matthew 25, all the nations of the world will be gathered before him for judgment. Acts 17 verse 31 says God has appointed a day when he, Jesus, will judge the world in righteousness. The first time Jesus came, he arrived almost unnoticed except for a few who recognized him. And ever since then, there have been those who have doubted and have scoffed that God would do such a thing. But when he returns, there will be no more doubts. And in the words of Philippians 2, 10 and 11, the day is coming when at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you know that there are no atheists and no agnostics in hell? Everyone who is there and everyone who is going there knows beyond any doubt that Jesus Christ is Lord. Their eternal problem is that they will have made that confession too late. That is why Jesus is coming the second time, to separate the saved from the lost. He will reward the saved and the lost will be separated from God forever. The words of 2 Thessalonians 1 again. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. 
They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. And when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints, to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. Where is heaven? Nobody knows. But what we do know is that it won't be on this earth as we know it. Because Peter says that when the Lord comes again, this earth and everything in it is going to be destroyed. So it won't be here. It will be in, a, in another place or in another dimension. The Bible actually gives us very little details about heaven. But there is no doubt about A, its existence, and B, how to get there. Charles Spurgeon said, You need not to know much about heaven. It is where Christ is, and that is heaven enough for us. When Jesus comes, he is coming to receive those who have believed the gospel, those who have chosen in this life to love, to serve, to obey, and to worship him. And at his return, all who have rejected him are going to be turned away to everlasting torment. Now, this is not a particularly popular message, especially at this time of year. But as the church, we can make no apology for it. God has always kept his word. And his word clearly warns us about this place called hell. As I'm sure you know, it's been well documented that Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. So how can we ignore it? The mere fact that we might not like the idea of a literal place called hell... And the fact that so many people are offended by this idea is not going to change the reality of its existence. Jesus came the first time to bring a message of hope and of peace. He came to offer his life as an atoning sacrifice for those who choose to believe in him. That's one of the reasons why we call this time between the two comings of Jesus the age of grace. There is still time to turn to him and to accept his gift of salvation. But time is running out. So when will he return? The Bible doesn't tell us that. And through the ages, men have set dates, but each one has come and gone, much to their shame and their embarrassment. And they conveniently ignored Matthew 24, verse 36, which tells us that no one except God himself knows the day. Not even the angels know. What we do know is that he will come without warning. 2 Peter 3.10 again, The day of the Lord will come like a thief. And the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 40, You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. If you love and serve Jesus, you have nothing to fear. As Paul wrote in 2 Timothy, verse 4, There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. If you have confessed with your own mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you have nothing to fear and everything to look forward to. But if you have not, you have every reason to fear. The, the alternative to eternal life with God in heaven does not bear thinking about and if you've yet to turn to Jesus, then I beg you to stop wasting precious time. Repent and turn to Christ. Now, of course, none of this will make any sense until you've decided for yourself how you view the Word of God, the Scriptures. Do you think that the Bible is the Word of God? Or is it just a collection of man-made stories which have been passed down through the years? For many, it's just not in fashion or in vogue anymore to believe the Bible. People who do are branded as narrow-minded and naive. Maybe you're among those people who say, well, maybe not all of it is true. And you decide that there are some Bible teachings or commands that you can ignore or just disobey completely. And there are a lot of people doing exactly that, even people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. So that's an important question. Just what do you think about the Bible? Or what do you think about Jesus? Do you really believe that he is the only begotten Son of God? Or was he just a good man, a good teacher, and not much else? There are many people who, who think that you don't have to believe all of the Bible. You don't have to believe everything that's written about Jesus. You can just believe some of it. But in the Christian faith, there is no middle ground. 
You either believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God, or you don't believe that it is the word of God at all. You either believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, or you don't believe that he is the Son of God at all. It is all or nothing. So what do you believe? If you believe that the Bible is the revealed word of God, and if you believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, then you believe that things like the resurrection and the ascension are facts and not fiction. Because the Bible is true. Jesus really is the begotten Son of God. He really did die on that cross. He really was buried in that tomb. He really did rise from the dead. He really did ascend to the right hand of God. He really is making intercession for us. He really is preparing a place for us. And one day he really will come back. The big question is, are you ready for his return? The Bible teacher Stuart Briscoe tells the story of a man in his community where he was the minister. This, of this man who, he wasn't a Christian, but he was very well liked. He was a jovial and a popular character. And he never really took life seriously. And this man attended the funeral of a friend one day. And on the way out of church, he playfully punched Briscoe on the shoulder and with a laugh, he said, so I wonder who's next. And Briscoe says, it was him the very next day. Are you looking and longing for Jesus to return? Would you like him to come today? Would you be ready if he came today? Or what if he'd come last night? Where would you be now had Jesus returned last night? John MacArthur said of the return of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus Christ is a cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith. It is not minor. It is not unimportant. It is not secondary or tertiary. It is, it is critical. It is a substantial reality in our faith. In fact, in some ways, the second coming of Jesus Christ is the most important of events because it's the end of the story. Because the second coming consummates everything. To minimize the second coming is to minimize everything else. Because this is the finale, the culmination. His return consummates the history of the world and the history of redemption and the fulfillment of all God's pledges, promises, covenants, threats and warnings. All blessing and all judgment in its final disposition is connected with the, with the coming of Jesus Christ. World history seems to, sometimes to be careering sort of helter-skelter, pell-mell into blackness and uncontrolled, but that is not the case. While man's behavior becomes less and less controlled, the very movement of history is under the sovereign control of God, who is moving it inexorably exactly to the point which he has predetermined, and that is the return of Jesus Christ. There is no greater truth that should have a greater effect on how we live our lives than the truth of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Just two days ago, we celebrated the coming of Jesus. And as I said on Christmas morning, it's a story we are so familiar with. God entering our world in human form is a crucial part of God's plan of salvation for mankind. And without the manger in Bethlehem, the plan would be incomplete. But there's an equally crucial part of that plan which is yet to be fulfilled, and that is the return of Jesus. His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his return. It's all the same story. And all of those pieces make up one puzzle. Jesus has promised to return, and he will. The second last verse in the Bible says, Come, Lord Jesus. Are you ready to say those words? And are you ready for his return? Shall we pray? Father, at this time of year, we celebrate your first coming. We remember the manger in Bethlehem. We sing the Christmas carols. We hear the heartwarming story again. And we are filled with the wonder that you would do this for us. But how easily we forget that your return, Lord Jesus, is just as an important part of the story of salvation. And your return is going to be very different to your first arrival. And so, Lord, we pray that you would keep us faithful to you. 
We look forward to the day when, when finally every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And our earnest prayer is for those who have yet to do so. We pray that you'd fill us with a sense of urgency as we share the hope of the gospel with the lost. Father, you have kept all of your promises. And we look forward to the day when you will fulfill that one, that you will return for your bride, for your church. And so we give you all honor, praise, and glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.